we need to bring back the right to offend people. Yes. It used to be that thinking that cultures can be better or worse was not a controversial thing. And for some reason, now we're not allowed to say the values that the Chinese Communist Party stands for are horrific. There are people inside of Twitter that are trying to suppress content that is not in the interest of the CCP. We're now having a very serious argument about whether or not teaching gender ideology to five-year-olds is a good thing. We're definitely going to see a whole new wave of different ethnicities that reject American progressivism. We've had a generation of people trying to convince us that America was bad, the world is about to end because of climate change. What we need to do is say, hey, we've made some mistakes, but we need to bring back the ideals and values that we had before. Do you think that America's future is brighter or darker? All right, guys, bang, bang, I've got Lucas here with me. Uh, I'm very excited to have this conversation. I thought a great place to start would be with TikTok, which is now the most visited website in the world. Uh, it has taken American uh, teenagers by storm. Uh, but there's a dark side to this. And uh, there's a lot of folks who are issuing warnings about uh, maybe America shouldn't be embracing a technology like this. Help us understand, like, what are the risks to something like a TikTok? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I think back in 2020, we really had the idea about banning TikTok. And that was a very good idea that ended up getting nowhere. And realistically, TikTok is owned by ByteDance, which is a Chinese company. ByteDance, for all we know, is controlled by the CCP. You know, China has a law that basically allows people, uh, that, that allows the government to request any information of any company. Uh, so effectively, any Chinese company works for the CCP. So we have an app that is owned by a Chinese company that is controlled by the CCP that is the most used app of every American, every, every young American in the country. We don't really understand how they run the algorithms. We don't really understand what they're putting up for our teenagers to watch. And that's effectively what's been happening. So algorithms, I think, are an interesting component of this argument, right? Which is uh, if I go on Facebook, if I go on Twitter, uh, I can look in the news feed or I can look on my Twitter timeline and I can either choose to get a, uh, a feed that is algorithmically determined. They're trying to predict what I want to watch uh, or what I will engage with. Or I can choose to have reverse chronological order, which is just, hey, I follow a certain number of people. Whoever posted last, that is kind of the first thing, and I can scroll through. Uh, but there's not this algorithmic uh, or kind of editorial layer on top of it. TikTok, my understanding is they don't have a reverse chronological order option. It is 100% algorithmic, and that's one of the questions I think people are asking is, uh, are they manipulating that in some way, uh, in an adversarial way, for American audiences versus other countries? Right. And so that that's what I think is really important to hone in on because I think a lot of the conversations that we had in 2020, 2021 around TikTok were about the data and perhaps there was an interesting argument to be made there, but I think it's mostly a distraction. Uh, you know, ultimately, we have the CCP, which sees itself in a long struggle against America, that has the control to potentially put in whatever they want, you know, American teenagers to see. Let's magnify all the issues that the country is having. Let's magnify all the worries, all the concerns that, you know, this younger generation is having by, you know, controlling what they see. Now... I don't really understand why people haven't really taken action against this. Realistically, imagine if we were back in the 70s in the Cold War against the Soviet Union and we had a major TV channel that was controlled by the Soviet Union where all the young Americans at the time wanted to watch. Mm -hmm. Would that like would that be controversial? Like what? what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and, and for some reason now we can't really have that conversation. Yeah. Well, if you think even the United States, when we are at war or sometimes not even actually direct combat, uh, but we are trying to um, change the way that people think around the world, like we drop pamphlets all right. over certain areas uh, with very specific messaging. We did it in uh, the Middle East. We've done it in many other areas uh, throughout the years. Um, and in some way, it's psychological warfare. Uh, and we look at it as we want to inform people of a different viewpoint or we want to educate them so that they'll see uh, that it doesn't have to be the way that you know their country or, or their city or town or whatever is run. The you know, that strategy on steroids would be imagine if they all had an app on their phone and they had smartphones and that that is the number one thing that they consumed. And we had the ability to uh, manipulate the content that was shown right. to them. 
I think that we could probably change some minds pretty quickly. Right. I mean, th- th- that's a very good point. You know, ultimately, every government in the world understands the role of propaganda, mm-hmm. right? Like what China could be doing, it pr- probably is doing with TikTok, is not new. Every country, America, every other country has done that to countries that they that they saw as competitors, right? Um, so it, it's really weird that here in this situation, we can't recognize a threat that that might be happening and the impact that that could be having in generations, in future ge- generations. Why do you think Americans are so slow to recognize this? Is it because uh, their kids use TikTok and so they think of it just as an app, uh, no different than Twitter or Facebook or, or Instagram or anything else? Uh, or do you think that it's because uh, there's a lot of former politicians that are lobbying for TikTok and so we just can't get anything done? Like, what, wh- Why is it that this seems to be something uh, that is a fringe conversation but not actually resonating with, uh, with the mainstream? You know, I, I think... It's a, it's a dangerous conversation to have because at that point we, we start getting a lot into culture. Uh, I think the, the simple version of that argument is, uh, the, the simple answer to it is that at the end of the day, there's a lot of politicians that you know, may, may just benefit from the fact that you know, the people that are watching TikTok now will probably, are probably going to vote for them. Mm-hmm. Um, realistically, I think the, the bigger issue that we see with TikTok today is that over the last 20 to 30 years, we've actually killed the idea of a national interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've completely decoupled the idea of business and the economy f- with national security. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, realistically, um, I think that, you know, people like me, like I, I think you and I probably share a common background as like, libertarian guys like like bitcoin like rumpel like you know like 20 12 years ago that kind of stuff um and all of that made a lot of sense you know let's let's get government out of the way we we, you know let's globalize the world um and america is going to benefit from that the reality is that did not happen Mm -hmm. and as that did not happen america did not change its strategy but in the process we actually killed the idea that the economy and national interest should have some something in common, mm-hmm. uh, and unfortunately, that 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 is kind of core to the argument as to why people don't really care about it that anymore. I mean, we're gonna talk about the chips at, at some point, but like, talk about something insane that's been happening, right? Like, mm-hmm. you have Intel that stands to, by the way, massively benefit from all the money that's coming from the Chips Act was heavily lobbying, lobbying the government to try to stop the government from trying to curb U.S. investments into Chinese into the Chinese chip, chip sector, right? So Intel was saying to the U.S. government, stop allowing U.S. investors to make investments in Chinese companies that are creating no, chips? No, 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 no. Or the reverse? The reverse. The reverse, right? Like, I mean, how insane is that? So Intel was actually, so the U.S. government was trying to curb U.S. investments into the Chinese chip sector. And Intel spent records amount of lobbying money to try to stop the U.S. from doing that. And that's because they wanted more and more U.S. investment to go into these Chinese manufacturers of chips. But the argument uh, from the critics of that strategy would be, hey, if the United States continues to increase dependency on supply chains in China, uh, we basically are just exposing ourselves from a national security standpoint. Uh, And so it's probably pretty important that we build our own supply chains, manufacturing capabilities for our chips uh, where we're not reliant on China, who if one day they just turn that off, basically we're fucked. Exactly. I mean, th- that's exactly right. And I think what's important to highlight there is that the notion of free markets, which I stand for, which I believed in and I've always believed in, is in some ways, at its best, an amoral ideology. Mm-hmm. At its worst, you end, up peop- you, you end up having companies and having leaders and having people that choose to do what's best for them at the expense of, the, of what's best for the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we need to fight back against that. We need to fight back against that hard. I mean, rea- realistically, right? Like, if we were having that conversation in which a U.S. company was trying to, uh, you know, do business with the Soviet Union or trying to invest in critical uh, industry and infrastructure for Hitler, we would call that person a, tra- a, a traitor, mm-hmm. right? Now, it's just business as usual. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's fascinating is uh, Google, Facebook, many other companies are not allowed in China. So this is not something where 
you could argue that China doesn't think in this way. They have long blocked U.S.-based technology companies from servicing their uh, citizens. And some people would just argue, oh, they want to create a regulatory moat so that there's Chinese companies that can be built and get economic progress and, and can capture that value. Uh, but now it looks like there's a you know second or an alternative right. reason for that, which is uh, even if the United States was to say, OK, we understand that – uh, there is a benefit from an entertainment standpoint or whatever uh, for our citizens to use this application. We don't want to ban it, but we're going to fight back. We're going to go on offense ourselves with some of these platforms. There's nobody who has access right. to the China market. That's right. And, and this is one of the most frustrating parts of this argument, which is a lot of times you talk to people here and you're saying, hey, the TikTok thing is a big deal, like it's a big issue. And they're like, no, 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 we can't ban TikTok. That would be too provocatory towards China. And I was like, really? Like, we're just asking to level the playing field. That, that's all it is. Like, they've treated us like that for decades, yeah. right? Like, I mean, the amount of money that companies have spent trying to dominate the China market only to sell, you know, whatever was, was left for nothing um, is insane, um, so we're just saying, like, actually, like, China has, you know, decided to treat us like that for a long time. And we're just going to do the same to them until we can actually find a middle ground that works. Are we at, reasonable? Are we at war with China or are we simply in competition with China? Like, how adversarial yeah. is it versus just pure competition and, and there's a ruthlessness that our competitor is exhibiting that maybe the United States isn't willing to exhibit? You know, I, I think that there are different sides to this argument. You know, Jacob Hoberg, who I think you've had on the show, uh, would say that we're at war. Um, and I think where I agree in, in, with that argument is we are at a pretty dire situation that most of the country has not really woken up to yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps calling it a war uh, would actually be very helpful to get people to really have that sort of Sputnik moment mm -hmm. and wake up to the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, the more complicated version of this is that realistically, China sees war in a way that is different than the American mind mm -hmm. sees it. Um, How does the American mind see it versus China? Yeah, and I would point your listeners, uh, there's a, a Chinese uh, uh, CCP uh, book called Unrestricted Warfare that was written by a few Chinese generals that now uh, are very high up in the, in the CCP uh, about 25, 30 years ago. Um, and that paper, Unrestricted Warfare, basically says that the American mind and the Western mind th tends to see uh, war as a very, in a very black and white way. Uh, you either go to war and you send your soldiers and then you win or you lose. And in reality, China, China sees war in a completely different way. Um, you know, there is cyber warfare, there is propaganda, there is, you know, supply chains, like, and everything can be a subject of warfare, mm -hmm. uh, to a given degree. Mm -hmm. So it's much less black and white and much more in the spectrum on everything that can be from a cold war to a hot war. So it's basically, there's like direct combat all the way to indirect competition or uh, influence to some degree. Correct. And the American culture, American movies, American uh, approach has very much been black and white, we're at war, we're not. I would question that uh, kind of black and whiteness now. There are countries around the world where we're dropping bombs, but we're technically not at war with them, uh, at least officially. And so that seems to still follow the line of uh, we are bombs, bullets, soldiers, you know, that's war. Uh, everything else is not. Um, but the Chinese seem to think that maybe the battlefield uh, and kind of more uh, of the battlefield is the indirect uh, competition and uh, influence. So things like the propaganda, the psychology, the supply chains, all of that seems to be where they have located and said, hey, this is the more important part. Uh, why is it that they're focused there? Well, that's where they have always excelled, right? So if you look back into the history of the CCP, um, there is one of the best books, the best book I've read all year, by the way, it's called The Long Game by this guy called Rush Doshi. Um, and Doshi goes in and looks at the history of the CCP and everything that happened since Mao left power. Um, and China has a, you know, an aspect of grand strategy that they have seen nation building, uh, you know, taking a hundred year mindset to it. 
uh, you know, there is this idea of a national national rejuve, rejuvenation mm -hmm. uh, that is pretty big. And by the 100 year anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, um, you know, they expect China to be the biggest country in the world. To answer your question specifically, why do they see that uh, war in such a different way? It's because that's where they can win. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to Deng Xiaoping, that was one of the leaders of the CCP back in the 70s, the mandate of China was um, hide your capabilities and bide your time. Mm -hmm. um, don't show your fangs. Don't go out to anybody. Don't get into conflicts. Just build industries that can take China so that China by 2050 can become the greatest nation in the world. And then back in the 90s, in the early 90s, um, China had what they call the traumatic trifecta. Uh, you had the Gulf War, you had the fall of the Soviet Union, and then you had um, Tiananmen Square. Uh, and all of those things really traumatized China and led China to become much more uh, military focused than before. Um, you know, talk about how China uh, thinks about fighting a hot war. Even in that sense, China thinks about very much asymmetric warfare, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if the U.S. has, you know, these billion dollar ships, these bi billion dollar aircraft carriers, um, what if you can build like a million dollar missiles to, to get rid of them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's how China would think about fighting. And, th and if you look at, you know, their defense infrastructure, that's pretty much what they've built over the last 20 years, right? Like the U.S. is still very much stuck in this idea of, you know, spending billions of dollars to build these giant things. China is, you know, spending less money to build like things that can, you know, destroy the, the, the U.S. infrastructure with, with, with much less money. It's fascinating because the United States, our single greatest military victory in, I don't know, the last 20, 30 years was we put like 16 dudes on a helicopter. We dropped them off in the Kandahar Mountains in Afghanistan and we said, go fuck up the Taliban. Right. And we were pretty successful in doing it. And then we went into and transitioned our strategy from uh, kind of direct action, take out a group of people that – Globally, I think most people were like, hey, these people uh, need to be handled um, to a nation building exercise. And that's where billions and billions of dollars came in. And, and uh, it changed the way I think that America was engaged uh, across the Middle East, but specifically in Afghanistan to start. And if you go back to uh, kind of what worked in the beginning, right, if you, if you think of kind of the military fighting force, it was like the tip of the spear is the single greatest uh, fighting force in the world. And we were hyper effective in those early days in Afghanistan. But I don't know why uh, we decided to do the nation building exercise. Right. You know, there's the arguments of uh, it brought profits to the defense uh, industry. There is uh, a kind of a continuation. We didn't know what else to do. Um, you know, there's some people who just say, hey, look, it was a mistake, right? There's all kinds of explanations or, or, or theories. But to me, there's no difference between let's build a million dollar missile to take out a billion dollar piece of infrastructure than, hey, let's put, you know, 15, 16 people on a helicopter and send them somewhere and let them do their thing. And uh, sure, there's a lot of money that goes into training those people and, and uh, equipping them and getting them there and all that stuff. But it sure isn't, you know, billions, if not trillions of dollars that ends up getting spent to wage uh, kind of these mechanized wars uh, that also then lead to these nation building exercises. And it right. feels like maybe China understands that and doesn't have an appetite for or for those kind of bigger ideas. They simply want the more targeted, uh, uh, almost sniper like approach rather than uh, the bigger uh, efforts. Yeah, I, I would say I think if you look at the CCP today, I think they definitely have a much bigger appetite for, you know, spending big money on big missiles, b b big ships and all that kind of thing. Uh, they, they, they have certainly avoided that uh, historically up until, you know, the last 10, 20 years. Uh, I think now as Taiwan comes into play, um, Chinese defense spending has definitely gone up quite significantly. They definitely have a lot of aircraft carriers, things that they never did, did before. I mean, the the building of the first Chinese aircraft carrier was actually a, a very good point in time that you can see, okay, like if you look historically, that's when things started to shift. Interesting. Now, on, on your point uh, about uh, America, you know, I think there is this... Uh, you know, joke that the U.S. really sucks fighting wars for the last one ever since Vietnam. Um, that's not really true. Uh, you know, realistically, I think you cited the example with the Taliban. That's 100 percent true. If you look back at the Gulf War, I mean, the Gulf War was like extremely effective. I mean, holy shit. Like you, you look at, at the data um, and I don't remember exactly exactly the number of soldiers, but but it was like like 
over 10,000. And the U.S. has like four casualties or something like that. It was, it was incredible. Uh, so the U.S. is good at fighting that. The reality is it is unfeasible to fight those type, types of wars uh, in the world today, nor necessarily should we be fighting those, fight, uh, those kinds of war in the world today. So if that's the world that we're living in, how can the U.S. adapt to the new reality of unrestricted warfare? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is where I think we have not necessarily done a good job or evaluated enough um, this new world that we're living in, because what this means is everything becomes a battlefield. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's not that we're going to send you know, some soldiers in the desert to fight this war against the enemies, and they're going to send their soldiers. Realistically, all of our infrastructure becomes weaponized. Mm-hmm. All of our apps become you know, a propaganda place. Um, so if this is the world that we're living in, what are we doing to recognize the new challenges that we have now that we didn't have 20 years ago? So when we think of, let's just take a kind of mobile technologies, right? So anything going on your smartphone, apps, uh, uh, et cetera. When you look at that, should we just ban every single Chinese company from putting their technology into the American market? Is there some sort of uh, framework or evaluation process that we should implement? And uh, should a government official, should a private organization, you know, be the one to kind of execute that evaluation? Like, what do you think is the solution uh, to at least address um, uh, the technology side of what goes on an American citizen's phone? Yeah, um, there's a couple of different answers to that. Um, I think from a, from a supply chain perspective, uh, I think at the very least, we should recognize that we have a few couple of very, very important rare earths and minerals and metals that make the supply chain and, and, and that make basically every single piece of equipment and technology that we use today. Getting access to those and then getting access to semiconductors is extremely important. China has a very good degree of control over that. You know, I just did a, uh, a podcast episode on my podcast uh, with uh, Nate Pekarsik that he goes very deep on that. I mean, listen to that and you see like China has actually spent like 20, 30 years really planning how can we actually get control of those minerals because they're becoming ever more important. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having a strategy for how can we actually get the core items in our supply chain that we use every day for basically everything that, that, that we need for every equipment that we use is really important. Now, I don't personally think that we need to ban every single item from China. You know, in some ways, China it has become the factory of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that actually benefits Americans to some degree. You know, there's a lot of low piece equipments that we need. There's a lot of um, things that come from China that the U.S. customer can get, and that overall increases the quality of life of the average American. I I could buy that argument to some degree, Mm -hmm. but, you know, the vulnerability that America has with, um, you know, some of these core items on the supply chain is absurd, and we absolutely need to change that. What are some of those areas on the supply chain that you're like, these are our biggest risks, or these are the areas that we should really be paying attention to? Well, rare rare earths and semiconductors are by far the the biggest issues. I mean, we're seeing everything that's happening with uh, Taiwan and and TSMC. We need to change that, absolutely. Um, Explain that situation a little bit more. Most people, I don't think, actually understand uh, kind of the relationship between China and Taiwan, but also TSMC and kind of their global importance for the semiconductor industry. Yeah, so... um, on China and Taiwan, um, so when the Chinese Communist Party took over uh, China almost 70 years ago, um, the party in power fled to Taiwan, and Taiwan was declared an independent country. Um, realistically, China has always considered Taiwan to be part of China, and they have the so-called One China policy. Um, and it's very controversial in the sense that this was never a big deal. And realistically, the U.S. or the U.N. have never really cared that much about recognizing Taiwan uh, as a sovereign nation. Uh, you could, you know, look historically, uh, and you would always find records saying that Taiwan was a sovereign nation. But you know, it's not like people were really, really cared about standing up for that that much. Um, and what happened was, um, you know, as the semiconductor in- industry evolved. Um, Without getting too into the details here, what you see uh, is that ever you know over the last 20, 30 years, the main developer of semiconductors became 
TSMC, not in not Nvidia, not Intel. It became the Taiwanese company, uh, which make really high quality semiconductors that we use in basically every single core piece of technology uh, today. Um, and in this scenario, as the you know fight between U.S. and China continues to escalate, China taking over Taiwan become, becomes an existential issue for the U.S. Realistically. You know, talk about all the wars and nation building things that the U.S. has done over the last 20 years. Part of why a lot of people today agree that, like, we wasted our time there is because there was not really a vital U.S. interest at play in a lot of these wars. Mm -hmm. We were fighting, but we're not really we didn't really know what we were fighting for. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the case of Taiwan. We actually do need that. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, if China takes over Taiwan. It will send the U.S. five to ten years in the past technologically. How easy, from a military standpoint, will it be for China to do it? I mean, China is a massive country. As you said, they've made significant investment in aircraft carriers and various other military um, kind of functionality. Uh, Taiwan's not a huge place population-wise, not very big. Uh, is this something where uh, if China decides to do it, Barring some sort of external support from the United States, Taiwan stands no chance of uh, being able to fight off China? It's it's a complicated answer. Uh, realistically, so President Biden actually said, I think six months ago, or less than that, that the U.S. would actually fight to defend Taiwan. That was the first time that a U.S. president has actually made a statement like that. Mm -hmm. um, and after making a statement like that, if China were to do this, the U.S. would either have to go do something or lose all of its credibility. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, um, over the last two presidencies, the U.S. has tried to rebuild what they call the Quad uh, and build more relationships with Australia and Southeast Asia mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, countries like Japan and South Korea that also don't stand to benefit from having China become a bully uh, in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, so... It would be complicated. Uh, China certainly has a lot of leverage by the fact that Taiwan is, you know, right next door. But things could get ugly very fast. Yeah, I, I saw, um, and I forget who who said this, but uh, they basically were saying, look, uh, the Taiwanese citizens. Uh, I think there's like 20 million or so uh, citizens there. They basically need to hold on for two weeks. It would take the United States uh, approximately two weeks to understand what was happening, uh, kind of rally, uh, get resources, equipment, everything to uh, Taiwan to be able to help uh, kind of support them. Uh, but those first two weeks would be incredibly important. And if uh, uh, the ultimate formula in, in this person's mind was just what percent of the citizens are going to fight. Right. right. And, and we see this a little bit in Russia, Ukraine of, uh, you know, w whether you want to think it was a good idea or not, uh, it appears that the Ukrainian government basically turned to their citizens and said, you know, we need some of you to stay. Uh, we will give you guns. We will give you equipment, but we need you to fight. And I, I think that it's a very uh, uh, different approach. Right. If you think in the United States, uh, I think people have a hard time believing uh, because the idea of an invasion uh, is hard to imagine when you have you know two oceans on either side and uh, you generally have friendly neighbors. But if we were ever in a position where we said, hey, in the United States, you need to fight. I wonder what what's the percentage of people who would fight. Right. right. And then you go to some of these other countries and in Ukraine, I think people were surprised by the percentage of people who stayed to fight. Right. It, it was a, a positive surprise. Taiwan remains to be seen what that answer would be. Right. Well, um, I don't claim to know Taiwanese people and Ta Taiwanese culture uh, well enough to, uh, you know, know what would happen in that mm -hmm. case. But what I do think that you've touched on that is a slightly different topic, but a very interesting one is, are people really willing to die for anything today? Mm -hmm. what, what happened over the last 20 years that the idea of people fighting, you know, Ukrainian citizens fi fighting for Ukraine is inspiring, but also like to some degree mind boggling in today's culture. Um, whereas in reality, you know, fighting for your country, fight, fighting for what you believe in was always the standard, right? Like that was life. Uh, and to some degree, and I, by the way, I, I think it's a positive thing that as, you know, wars stopped happening and, you know, we've had, you know, to some degree, America being the leading force in the world, you know, people don't really believe in that many things anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, we, we have companies today. Companies are the core piece of institutions that we have. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what is left. But 
the idea of national pride, the idea of national culture, the idea of religion, it feels like we killed all of those things mm -hmm. over the last 30 to 50 years. And now we have a generation of people that don't really believe in anything. Mm -hmm. um, and you see depression rate going up. You see, you know, nihilism on the rise. Um, and I think we should sit back and, and, you know, say, like, is this really the world that we want to live in? Mm -hmm. And when you look at China, how much nationalism is in the country of China? Like, is culturally, are they following the global trend and they've lost uh, uh, belief and loyalty and adherence to some of those ideals? Uh, or are they actually counter trend and they are deepening allegiance and loyalty uh, from a nationalistic view? Uh, and so they're kind of the outlier. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't claim to speak for the whole Chinese culture. Uh, what I can say is, you know, when you look at a country that was going, growing 10% a year, every year for the last 20 years, or, you know, something, some really crazy high amounts, the population is going to be happy. And realistically, like the population is going to be on board with whatever the leading party is in place. And that's true for basically every country that is experiencing crazy growth. That, that always happens. Um, the answer for the CCP is very clear. The CCP has a long-term plan to make China the you know, middle kingdom once again. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where it's actually really hard, uh, I think, for, for Americans and people from all over the world to understand how China thinks about these things. Like, the U.S. is a little bit over 200 years old. China, is, China has a history of 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. For a long time, China was actually the, the number one country in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, China experienced it not too long ago from that historical perspective, what they call the century of humiliation with the Opium Wars, and then, you know, the Cultural Revolution and all of those things, you know, where China became an extremely poor country. China had a famine that killed 30 plus million people. Um, so some really hard, hard times. And now the opportunity to once again b become the leading economy of the world and then the, the, the leading superpower of the world. Um, so there is a lot of nationalism going on. There is a lot of pride for Chinese culture. Uh, and, you know, there is a sense of cohesion around the mission of making China this, you know, once again, great nation. Uh, and recognizing that that's what we are, you know, being challenged against is really important. How much of American culture and American companies are contributing to this kind of China long-term strategy. And I'll give you kind of two examples, right? So we've got John Cena, who uh, made some commentary, uh, wasn't well-received in China. It's important that uh, movies, if you are optimizing purely for profit, get into China. He issued an apology, uh, uh, basically saying, hey, you know, Taiwan uh, essentially is not an independent country, um, which I think shocked a lot of people. And they said, what is going on? John Cena, what are you doing? Uh, but then also we recently saw Apple uh, has reportedly asked some of their suppliers to stop labeling the products made in Taiwan and instead replace them with labels that say made in China. Now, it's a report in the mainstream media. You can question the validity of it. But if we accept that that is a true uh, uh, thing that's happening, are American companies and American culture almost playing right into what the, the Chinese uh, CCP wants to actually occur? Well, they, they absolutely are. Today's episode is brought to you by Alto IRA. Have you wanted to buy Bitcoin or over 200 other cryptocurrencies in your retirement account? Well, now you can with Alto IRA. They allow you to buy Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in a tax advantaged way. There's no account or setup fees, and it's super simple to get started. You can go today to altoira.com slash pomp to get started. altoira.com slash pomp. Invest in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in your retirement account and get all the tax advantages while still holding digital currencies. altoira.com slash pomp. There is, there is no question about it. I, I think it's really hard to argue that we have a lot of companies today, a lot of influential leaders they're actually doing what is best for the CCP and not best for their own con country. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really bizarre that something like this is happening. You know, if, if you go back to World War II, right? So World War II, the U.S. gets attacked, the U.S. goes to war, and you see companies like GM, okay, all the big car manufacturers, all the big manufacturing com companies of the U.S. basically get the message, you know what? Our business just changed, we're not producing cars. We are now producing war weapons. We're producing airfare, like uh, aircrafts. 
and GM even changed its tagline. GM tag, GM's tagline during during the war was "Victory is our business." Um, and fast forward, you know where we are now. We have companies that are more than happy to you know follow along the mandates of the CCP that are literally telling them what should they, what they should be saying, mm -hmm. and then go back and you know in the US. And, you know, gives us, give us uh, some, you know, moral superiority spiel on what we should be thinking, right? I mean, take what's happened to Hollywood, right? Uh, like, there was an amazing book that came out in the last year called The Red Carpet that documents the relationship between Hollywood and China. Mm -hmm. And, you know, put aside the fact that you've had a lot of, you know, Hollywood um, movie studios get acquired by China, you have a lot of studios that were more than happy to put in movies what China told them to put, mm -hmm. as long as they could get access to the China to, to the Chinese market, right? I mean, I remember uh, there, there's two uh, examples that, that happened here that are very f funny, very interesting. One, you have there's a movie called The Red Scare. Uh, it's actually a remake of a 60s movie, and it's this idea that you actually have, you know, someone from the Soviet Union infiltrate someone in America in a small town, and then there is a, a communist movement that goes on and tries to overtake the U.S. government. Um, and it was, you know, Cold War, so it was obvious that, you know, the U.S. was going to fight against the Soviet Union. And about 10, 20 years ago, I don't remember exactly when, they, tried, they, they decided to remake that movie. Uh, and there was, a, you know, an obvious question, like, who should it be? You know, like, okay, like, the Soviet Union's gone. Um, Russia doesn't seem, like, as bad as the Soviet Union was back then. It should be China, right? Like, China is still owned by, it is still uh, ruled by, by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and it could be the ma a major challenge to America. So they tried to remake that movie. Uh, I think the movie was with Brad Pitt, actually. Uh, and when they put China as... Uh, being the the main challenger to the U.S. in that movie, China decided to to basically say you're not doing that, and and they fought hard against that, and they basically, if you watch the movie, the movie actually did come out, and I think the I, I never watched the movie, but but if you look at it, the the main competitor that the U.S. is fighting in that movie, I think, is North Korea. It's like this really weird idea that, you know, the small nation of North Korea that had not really done anything for the last, you know, century is now going to try to overtake the U.S. And why did they do that? Because China basically told the U.S. movie studios to do that. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other example, which is interesting, I mean, if you remember, if you remember when the Star Wars, uh, uh, fran the new franchise came out with the last three movies, right? Uh, very diverse. Uh, you know, they have characters of a, lo a lot of different ethnicities. They have a lot char characters with a lot of different uh, skin colors mm -hmm. uh, to reflect, you know, the reality that, you know, you, the U.S. has changed. And we really value those things and we want to have those things in our movies now. Uh, and, you know, we're lectured by the movie theaters, by our elites every day that, you know, we need to do these things. Uh, that's that's culture. That, that's the culture that we want to live in. Uh, and that's what we're being told by them all the time. And then when they took that movie to China, they actually removed the black characters. They removed, uh, you know, the diverse characters from, from the posters, from everything. Because, you know, China is not on board with that and they want to make money on China. So that's fine. And it's just this gigantic double standard mm -hmm. of what we're being told by our elites, of what we're being told by our companies in Hollywood and beyond about what you should be told, uh, about what you should believe in. And when it comes to China, it's just business as, as usual. I'm just here to make money, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was this amazing, they, you probably remember this, this amazing uh, speech by Rick Gervais at, at the Oscars. Uh, uh, again, and he was talking to uh, Tim Cook uh, because he was there. Apple TV was just launched. And, he, and, you know, he basically just said, you know, if you get an award today, don't, you know, just don't be so sanctimonious about how good you are or how terrible our country is because realistically you're just, you know, operating off slave shops in China. So just take your literal award and go home. Uh, and we need, realistically, we need more people to speak up to that mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's a really bizarre situation that we're in.
Mm-hmm. Really bizarre. What about the supply chain? So like we, we've talked a lot about uh, mobile apps. We've talked about uh, some more psychological stuff. Uh, you have TSMC, which isn't in China. It's, it's in Taiwan, but there's a, a risk there that, that uh, something could happen. Um, but we have a lot of supply chains and manufacturing in China itself. Uh, what can the United States do to lessen the dependency? Is it just reshoring, bring back manufacturing, bring back uh, uh, labor opportunities and, and supply chains to the U.S.? Or are there other opportunities for us to, uh, to lessen that dependency? Yeah. Um, a couple of things. Uh, th- there are two big issues with supply chains happening today. The first one is, you know, we actually have a lot of dependencies on core uh, rare earth minerals, things that we already covered. The other thing that's still happening is, even though, you know, we're here in Miami and realistically, like life is normal after COVID, for China, China has still decided to, you know, continue what they call the zero dy- dynamic zero COVID. So China is still having a lot of lockdowns, including in cities that are core industrial cities for China. So because of that, you effectively have a lot of delays, you have a lot of issues with getting stuff that were you know, manufactured in China here. So those are the two big you know, issues. W- one part of the, the supply chain is getting weaponized. The other part is still suffering from a lot of COVID disruptions, even today. Now, as for things that we can do, I do believe that this idea of reshoring American manufacturing will be a big thing over the last 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like, we absolutely believe in that, excited to invest in companies that are doing that, because we absolutely need this to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, is it only in America? Not necessarily. You know, I think that, you know, one of the things that America should think very deeply about, about is who are the allies that will stand by the United States in this new divide that we're going to be living in. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we should absolutely, you know, be sending, uh, you know, more manufacturing to to Mexico, to, uh, you know, countries in Latin America that are supportive of the government, uh, of the U.S. government. But, you know, for sure, we need to rebuild a lot of infrastructure and manufacturing here in America. How much of the difficulties in reshoring around supply chains manufacturing is the cost of labor in the United States is just astronomically higher than obviously in China, but even places like Mexico uh, and some of our other allies. And so do we have to make a choice if we want to actually reshore, not move from you know China-based manufacturing and supply chain maybe to Mexico or, or somewhere else? If we actually want to bring it back within the borders of the United States. Uh, does this give uh, rise to robotics and basically says, hey, we're going to take the American kind of blue-collar worker uh, and we have to put them on the sidelines when it comes to supply chains and manufacturing because we just can't pay them and still compete from a cost perspective with some of these other areas? Right. Uh, absolutely. You know, we're investors in a company called Hadrian. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what Hadrian is doing uh, is effectively rebuilding the supply chain for the aerospace and defense industry. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of companies that tried to do this before, and they they tried to do this just with software. Uh, And and it's just, you know, tried just robotics, just autonomous machines. And part of the founder's insight is you actually need both. You need machinists, you need people who are extremely good at this that work better with machines. And I believe that is going to be the future of a lot of industries too. You know, realistically, absolutely you're right that we can't have, you know, manufacture everything in America with the cost of living and with the, you know, wages and things that we have here today. It would be prohibitively expensive. However, we do have the room for technology to not get rid of, but partner with blue collar jobs. Um, to, you know, really rebuild a a lot of the things that we need. Uh, I think a narrative that we unfortunately believed in for the last 50 years is is that this idea of college-educated workers are somehow a superior class to blue-collar jobs. And I think we hopefully we might go through a renaissance where we see, you know, a lot of people that are working on really hard working, like really hard working people that are working on these jobs to help rebuild the infrastructure of the United States. I mean, there was the Industrial Revolution, which obviously laid the foundation for the world that we know today in the United States and incredible economic prosperity and growth uh, as a nation. Um, it feels like there was a shift uh, maybe in the 90s to Wall Street and then in the 2000s and early 2010s, uh, more to Silicon Valley. But it was all about uh, optimizing ad systems or getting people to click on things. And, and uh, you know, I, I would argue that Facebook is a net positive for the world and, and uh, it's not so much like these things are bad. 
bad. Uh, but it does mean that many of our smartest, uh, most capable people uh, were not going and working on these really hard uh, manufacturing supply chain kind of industrial uh, type problems. Uh, I think that's changing. Right. I think you, myself and, and a couple other investors have spent quite a bit of time uh, making investments in companies. You know, some that come to mind immediately are obviously Hadrian, uh, Varda, Anduril, Traba. Like you can just go down the line. Uh, is this the next trend uh, that uh, will kind of lead to that renaissance is basically Silicon Valley style entrepreneurs saying, I understand how to build teams. I understand how to raise capital. I understand how to solve problems and think from a first principle standpoint. Now I'm not going to go do this in just a pure software uh, kind of consumer product space. I'm instead going to go to the industrial space and try to solve problems there. It is our best hope. You know, I think there's a lot to be talked about institutional decay and what has happened to government, what has happened to our other institutions over the last 20 plus years. But realistically, if we are to fix this, we need the most talented people in the world to help us fix those problems. And the most talented people in the world are working in technology today. I think that is a very fair statement. And I think is, is you probably agree that, you know, the most ambitious people, they want to start companies, they want to start, you know, the next unicorn, that kind of stuff. Um, so we need to find them and we need to partner with them and we need to throw all of our weight behind them to help solve those problems. Yeah. And when you see that, um, how much of this is uh, psychological or cultural uh, need to make people understand that this is important and it's okay to want to make the United States uh, uh, kind of this great country that uh, can continue to lead in manufacturing and, and kind of these industrial industries uh, versus actually solving technology problems or, or solving other types of things? Like, can we just change people's mindset and then that will uh, be 80% of the solution? Or are there a really hard manufacturing? manufacturing, supply chain, you know, type problems that need to be solved. And psychology is great, but like we still got to just solve the problems. Well, you know, I think realistically, there are absolutely, you know, real problems to be solved. Uh, and, and things that, you know, we may spend billions of dollars in trying to solve them and still fail. But I think that it doesn't change the fact that throughout history, you just had to do hard things and hope that something would work. So I, I don't know how to answer your question other than say, yes, those things are hard. They might not work, but if we don't have the most ambitious people with the most impressive visions of the future to spend all of their time, all of their you know, blood, sweat, and tears on these things, we're not going to figure it out. It's mm -hmm. very, that, that part is very clear. Mm -hmm. So all I can do is to hope to find the best people and try to rally them to help work on these issues and, and do that myself too, of course. Um, because if we don't do that, then I, I don't think we, we, we can expect anything to be solved. So what's interesting to me is uh, the government in the United States for uh, quite a while uh, helped to uh, build a lot of these industries and, and they pushed forward uh, innovation and progress. Uh, it feels like we reached an end point of uh, government programs being able to do certain things. So obviously the, the quintessential example is SpaceX uh, was able to do something that NASA wasn't, right? And uh, they're collaborative, they work together, but without SpaceX, uh, I don't think that we are anywhere near where uh, we are from a space uh, kind of innovation standpoint. Uh, we now see other private companies starting to push uh, the pace of innovation and progress. Andrew, obviously, when it comes to defense, uh, and many other examples. Uh, you had a conversation with Steve Blank recently, and he basically was like, we need to recreate or, or rebuild the Department of Defense. And I didn't get the sense that he's like, let's just go get trillions of dollars from the government and hire a bunch of government employees, and like that's going to be the solution. What did, were your takeaways from talking to you know what many people would consider a great investor, a, a great uh, kind of entrepreneur and coach, uh, but also a military veteran in uh, Steve Blank? Yeah, uh, you know, I think just the, the one thing I want to say about Steve Blank that I think is really important for, for people to know. Um, I think Steve Blank got very famous uh, about the lean startup, which you know a lot of people tied tied to, you know, the rise of consumer apps in the early 2000s. Uh, but, you know, Steve Blank is someone that has spent more time than basically anyone studying the relationship between Silicon Valley and, and, uh, and the defense industry. So if you look back at the history, Silicon Valley has always had ties to the Department of Defense. And, you know, hopefully we're going through a renaissance of that. 
Now, to answer your question specifically, you know, on what Steve thought it must be done, it's it's hard to believe that the people that are going to fix the issue are going to be the people that created the issue. <laughs> uh, and I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of what happens today with government is we have the same people that have been there the entire time. So I do think that there is a, pro a, a massive problem that, that we have today is that, you know, to your point, like the, the next Elon Musk is going to start a company. He's not going to work for NASA. That is a positive thing. Overall, the world is going to be better off because of SpaceX than if he had not done that. But we do need a new generation of people who are interested in rebuilding those institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I look back, uh, as you know, used to be the sort of libertarian guy, uh, I, I, there's a Ronald Reagan quote, you know, the, the eight most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> um, and... You know, I, I used to think that those things are fun. And as I, as I watched the institutional decay uh, happening for the last 10, 15 years, you probably remember this. There was a lot of people cheering for that, like, right? Like there was a lot of people saying the government sucks, you know, let's let it fail. And we'll probably be better off because of that. I think sitting here in 2022, it's very clear that we're not in a better position, right? Um, so we better have new people. We better have new, extremely talented people that have the ambitions of rebuilding institutions. Mm -hmm. We need new companies. We do, but we also need competent, highly, uh, hi highly competent institutions in the Department of Defense, but it also in other areas of the government that need to be that they need to be better working with startups, but they have an ambition of building a great country. Yeah. What's the role of government in? these innovative fields? Like, it, should the government be the one trying to invent new things and uh, kind of commercialize them? Uh, should it be like a public-private partnership? What, what have you seen kind of be the most effective uh, role for government? And, you know, there's the modern-day environment and there's kind of history. So maybe we can take some lessons from history and apply them to today. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, you know, in a lot of, in, in a lot of industries, I do believe that it's true that government needs to mostly stay out of the way. Um that's probably the answer for, you know, the vast majority of in industries. But in industries like defense, uh, where the government is the ultimate buyer of basically every product, the government does need to step up and show the path for these companies that are trying to innovate in the industry to be able to work with them. Uh, you know, a lot of these companies today, they, you know, spend years getting grants from the government, and, you know, just trying to build something, but in reality, they're never able to actually get a program of, of record and get the government to become the ultimate buyer. Um, so we need, like, we absolutely do need to change that. And, you know, we, we, we had a, a podcast recently with uh, Pete Newell that he goes very deep, deep on, you know, how do these SBIRs, STTR programs work? What do we need to do to reshape them? Because realistically, startups today if they're working on these really hard problems and the government is the ultimate buyer, they absolutely need to be able to, you know, get a path from the government. If you do these things and if you actually ex execute, we're willing to buy this. Um, and that maze is way too complicated. And I think it is the government's role to be able to fix a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. When we think about that government role, how much of the problems we're facing are rooted in a lack of math, science, and engineering education in the United States, maybe compared to other countries? Like if we just beefed up uh, kind of the way that we trained people and we got more math, science, and engineering uh, graduates or, or people who were interested in these fields, would that permeate all of society, both public and private market, and we would just kind of have a better educated workforce that then could go work on these problems? Well, I, I think... To be clear, I, I think from uh, startups would definitely benefit from that. New companies would definitely benefit for that, fr from that. Uh, and absolutely, I think we would have a lot more, you know, potentially great tech companies, great tech companies working in the defense industry if we had more engineers. But I think a lot of the problems with government and how it works with startups today are due to incentives more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So realistically, you know, what we need is not necessarily people to you know be smarter than they already already were is to realize that the set of incentives that we have in place are leading us to a path 
that may not be great for the country overall. That what, may be, what are the incentives? Well, realistically, uh, you know, the U.S. government works mostly with defense industries, um, uh, in, in the defense industries, work mostly with the big companies, the primes. Um, and, you know, they are the ones that have the power to lobby, that have the power to, you know, know the right people, get the right people to do things for them inside of the government. Um, and it's really hard. It's impossibly hard for a startup to break in. Uh, and the reality is, you know, when you have a set budget, uh, these become very zero sum games. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when you have, you know, the five primes fighting for a, for a certain budget and then you start startup wants to come in, the system is designed for the startup to fail. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, what happens is if we do need innovation if, and if we do believe that innovation is the only way that we're going to get out of this thing, uh, out of the situation that we're in. We do need the, gov the government to understand that, you know, the breakthrough innovations are going to come from these startups and we need to nurture them and we need to help to help them succeed. Mm -hmm. When we see that, um, why has Andrew been able to break through uh, to some degree? I, I know that one of their aspirations is to become the next great, you know, prime contractor right. in the defense industry. Why are they able to break through as a startup where maybe others are failing or designed to fail? Well, I mean, to be clear, um, it's probably one of the most incredible teams that came out of Silicon Valley. And I see they were based in L.A., but, you know, I see Silicon Valley broadly in the last 20 years. Right. Like if you look at the founding team of that company, you have an incredible visionaire and technologist. You have, you know, people who know the, the VC industry extremely well but also people that came from the government, right? Like a lot of that team uh, that came from working with the government. So a lot of that team came uh, from Palantir. And Palantir had to sue the government <laughs> at some point to actually be able to succeed. Um, so I think it was a combination of the right team at the right point in time. Uh, at a point that America and you know, people here, investors, were seeing the problems that we had from a geopolitical standpoint and saw that we needed a company like Andrew to, you know, start the wave of new companies uh, building in the defense industry. Why did Palantir have to sue the government? I don't, I don't think a lot of people know that story. Yeah, uh, and I, I don't claim to know the details. I, I would have to look it up. But ultimately, you know, and, and SpaceX did, did the same thing, by the way. Uh, so the way that, you know, because of the way that government procurement processes work, uh, the government makes very clear, like, you have to bid uh, for this project uh, at, you know, certain amounts, that given timeline. And, you know, they were able to prove that, you know, even though they were able to meet those things, uh, ultimately the government still went with, with, you know, with the old way of doing things, with, with the traditional primes, with, with the traditional contractors. So... Um, like I said, it's a system that is designed for these new companies to fail. Mm -hmm. um, and we need a new generation of, you know, officers that are able to recognize that we need those new companies to succeed and that we're all going to be better off for it. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's fascinating to kind of see, um, in many ways, uh, the Silicon Valley technologist who uh, for years have been labeled as uh, not wanting to follow the rules, not wanting to uh, um, kind of adhere to the old way of doing things, move fast, break things, like all these kind of anecdotes. Um, actually, when it comes to the Palantirs, the Andrews, uh, the SpaceXs, many of them, they work directly with the government. And what they're actually asking for is enforcement of the rules and frameworks uh, because they believe they have an advantage and they see that maybe those rules and frameworks aren't being applied equally uh, ac across the industry. And so it, it runs counter to, I think, what the mainstream narrative of like, oh, these people all just want to break the rules. Now, to be clear, there are plenty of companies, you can Uber, Airbnb, and, and others who show up and they say, hey, we're going to break the rules because we don't think the rules are right and we're going to lobby and try to get them changed or whatever. Uh, but it goes back to like the world's not black and white, right? That there's kind of a full flavor uh, across the industry of people who want to work within the rules. And then some people believe that, you know, breaking the rules is important. Uh, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, I think the nuance for me is that at the end of the day, um, I, I still believe that the future and all the innovation is created by rebels. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think what we need to recognize is that in the world that we're living in, not accepting the institutional decay that we've been living through and trying to build a great company to go reinvent the defense industry, reinvent aerospace is in and of itself an act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, now, 
you may not be able to move move fast and break things in those industries. And I don't think a lot of people have. Uh, but, you know, we should absolutely be inspired by, you know, the, the, the fact that so many of these individuals, so many of these founders were decided to go against all the forces, against everything that's status, status quo to try to build those great companies. Yeah. What are other industries outside of just defense that you see uh, kind of this institutional decline and you now believe that startups or kind of private enterprises uh, will be a, a key ingredient to helping uh, rejuvenate them? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't have as much depth on it, but I, I, I think healthcare for sure uh, is, a, is a big one. I mean, construction, real estate, all, all of these areas. Um, I mean, if, if you look at healthcare, healthcare is what, like a fourth of the US GDP, a fifth. Uh, it keeps growing. We never, we never know how it's going to stop. Like maybe 2050 is going to be half. Um, so absolutely, like the, the US health, healthcare system is on, it, on its way to bankruptcy. Um, this is very clear. So if companies don't fix that now, if, if, if institutions don't fix that now, um, it's going to get pretty ugly. Yeah. And then what about the role of venture capital? Right? We talked about the role of government, we talked about the role of private enterprise, but most of these startups are being funded by venture capital. Uh, it seems, I don't know, 10 years ago, it was not popular to go fund many of uh, these types of companies that were uh, now trying to rejuvenate institutions. Palantir maybe was one of the first ones where uh, Peter Thiel and a number of others said, hey, this is important work and, and we're going to go do this. Uh, there's a little bit bigger of a group of investors who are willing to do it, but still not uh, a massive number. Uh, what do you see as like the financier's role in uh, in this entire movement? Yeah, you know, I think there's a nuanced answer to this. Um, realistically, at the, at the end of the day, one could say that the role of investors is, is just to make money. Um, but I would say more importantly, there, w when, when people make that argument, a lot of what they try to say is, Hey, we don't know where the next breakthrough is going to come from. Like realistically, it's so random in venture capital. Like when you're looking at those startups at day zero, everything is so random that you don't really know, like what, what is, what can really have the power to change the world. Um, I believe in that. What I also believe in is that at the end of the day, you need to be working on something that matters. You need to be working on something important. And you don't know if that's going to be what's going to change the world. But there's a shot. And as a venture capitalist, you're betting on the shot. You know that, you know, nine out of 10 cases is going to fail, but when it succeeds, it's going to get really big. But if you don't have the conviction as a founder or as an investor, that you're working on something truly important to, be, to begin with, then I, I really have questions, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to be the next fart app that's going to really change things, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I do think that there is a role for working on things that matter, and I think that investors do have a responsibility there. Yeah. What, what's fascinating about this is uh, early on, it's betting on people. And uh, we've seen over and over again, uh, some of these companies are built by people who have industry experience, but more often than not, they actually don't have any experience in the specific industry, right? If you take uh, Palmer Lucky uh, and kind of his entire team at Andrew, they didn't have a ton of experience in the defense sector. Now, some of the people from Palantir, obviously, they had worked there uh, uh, previously. But when you're evaluating these teams, like what are some of the themes that you've seen uh, or, or kind of uh, traits that you're able to pull out and uh, kind of recognize uh, in a pattern that you're like, yeah, these people have a higher probability. It doesn't guarantee success, but they have a higher probability of succeeding versus maybe other teams that you all evaluate. Well, I, I, think, I think you need a secret. Right. Uh, and I think a, a question that I always ask is, what do you understand about the world that nobody else has realized? In mm -hmm. some ways, um, and it's sort of a cliche in venture capital, but you, you, you talk to these people and it just seems that they're living in the future. Mm -hmm. they, they see all the problems in the present. Um, they see a potential for a future world and the, the people around them have just not realized that yet. Mm -hmm. um, on, your point, on your point about Andrew, uh, I mean, you have an absolutely visionary founder that, to your point, did not have a lot of experience in defense, but had a team that actually did, that mm -hmm. really know the ins and, out, in, ins and outs of it. So that was a complete team, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in a lot of these really complicated industries, really regulated industries, when you actually have a complete team that is able, one, like has a visionary that is living in the future, but two, 
has compliments to that person that really understand like how the system works, not to necessarily always play by the rules, but to know how to, to know how and when to break them if necessary is really important. Yeah. And then what about uh, some of these folks who come from, uh, I'll call it Silicon Valley, uh, more as an idea rather than the physical uh, geography. Um, but we're now seeing more of those individuals uh, go into politics or go into uh, maybe positions of influence that aren't just running companies. Like how important is that or what are you seeing there? Well, you know, I think this goes back to, to what I was talking about. We need new people to rejuvenate the government to uh, change a lot of these institutions. Um, I welcome that. I hope, um, I hope more of this happens. I mean, let's go back 200 years, right? Like the founding fathers, a lot of the founding fathers believed that everybody should serve in public service at one point in their lives, mm -hmm. right? Up until Nixon, every, ma every man in America was expected to serve the, mil to, to serve the military, mm -hmm. right? Um, and now we don't have any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not advocating that, you know, we should be living, should be living in the, in, in the world that we, that we lived in. But I do think that there is a role for serving a higher interest than, than, than yourself. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing that we're seeing so many of these people run for office. Ideally, we're going to be seeing more people working with the government, working to rebuild our institutions and, you know, that that's that if we're going to solve those issues this is part of the process yeah um you recently moved to florida uh congratulations uh and i've heard you say that the future of america looks very similar to florida which will put many people uh their heads will spin when they hear that what do you mean by that well look um over the last two years um you know my girlfriend and i basically traveled we did a nomadic thing that a lot of people did we traveled over 25 states, you know, like saw over 40 states. Um, and it's very clear to me that, you know, in Florida, people are the happiest people I've ever seen in, in the U.S., like by far. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just come, just come here um, and, you know, you walk around and it's in people's faces. Um, you know, you walk around in California and you're trying to not step in human poo, right? Um, People here don't really accept that. <laughs> we refuse to think that's normal. Um, and, you know, ultimately, it is the, the one city, the one state in America that when you talk to people, they still believe, for one, that the U.S. is a good thing, right? The, which tw 20 years ago, no, no, nobody would disagree with that, that, that the U.S. is a positive force, force in the world. But they also believe that the f there is a hope for a future in America that is brighter than what we have today. Um, and it's, it's probably, there are probably other places in America that, that, that also believe in that, but people here really take pride in that. How much of that is because uh, there's such a deep-seated uh, kind of immigration uh, and it's a melting pot of people from, you know, a lot of uh, Central and South American countries, uh, but also other, you know, countries around the world. Do you need uh, kind of that um, uh, diversity of, of origin in order to continue to have that ideal uh, be persistently put on a pedestal and say, hey, you know, I came to America and so I believe in, in the ideas of the American dream uh, or is it something else? Um you know, I, I'm I'm an immigrant, so I I recognize the, the the role for you know America being the shining north star that everybody that, that everybody aspires to. Um, I think there is something to that, but I think if we are to you know take this counter back to what it was, we need to put the responsibility not just you know on immigrants. I think America could be, America is a great place. But on the shoulders of every single person in this, in this country to say, this is a great country, this country has great values, this country has a great culture, American culture actually stands for something. Um, and, you know, that's on everybody. So I, when, when I look at Florida, I, 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 you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, like uh, Cuban immigrants, Latin American immigrants that came here that knew what socialism was. Um, and sure, that's part of it too. But I think the average person here just takes pride in America being what it is. So you're unique. You're from Brazil, but you're here in America. And if somebody listened to the first half of this conversation, they would say like, man, this guy is very, very America first, uh, almost as if you were born here. Why is it that you're from another country, but you believe so deeply in America uh, and you're not 
living in Brazil and saying, hey, you know, Brazil should be the leading country in the world uh, and we need to go do all these things to, to make that happen? Yeah, well, I mean, look, if you look at the history of Latin America, it just basically swings back and forth. And, it, you know, we have there is a saying in Brazil that Brazil is going to be the country. Brazil is the country of the future and it will always be because, you know, there is always great promises of, you know, Latin American countries becoming great countries. And at some point they get taken over by the Communist Party of their countries and they go back to being shitty. I mean, just look at what's happening in Argentina now. I, I like I don't remember the exact numbers. I, I, I saw yesterday that the government of Argentina just raised the interest rates to 69.5 percent uh, because they're having inflation rates, I think, in the three digits now. Right. Um, and if you look at the history of Latin America, that's always what it was. Um, so, you know, I, I came here because I do believe that America is the, is the shiny North Star. I, I do believe that American values do stand for something. Um, and I think that, you know, the promise of the American dream that you can work hard and you will succeed um, is really important. Um, and even in the times of, you know, institutional decay, uh, I'll say, you know, it's it's really it's really uh, flashy, especially in tech and as a VC to say that you're very optimistic um, about the future and you're very optimistic about America and the West. Re to be completely transparent, I'm not that optimistic. Uh, I, I think we have some deep rooted issues. Uh, I think there's very good reasons to be pessimistic. But if we're going to go down, like we better go down, like kicking and screaming and fighting with everything that we have, you know, like realistically, like America is the only hope for the West. Uh, it, it, if, if America doesn't stand up, if America doesn't solve its issues, I don't believe that there is any, there's any other country, there's any other nation that will have the power to, you know, prevent the world from, you know, living in a communist dictatorship and everybody speaking Mandarin 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a possible risk? Oh yeah, it's absolutely a possible risk. Uh, like we, we have a, like we have a country that is run by communist dictators um, that have a very clear plan to becoming the, you know, one superpower of the world. Um, at some point, that conflicts with American ideals. That conflicts uh, with America as as being the power that it, that it has been for the last fifty years. So, do I believe that you know U.S. and China will engage in a hot war? Not necessarily. I think it's, I, th I think the possibility is certainly there, but realistically, we have to recognize that you know. American ideals or, you know, the ideals that people here used to have 50 years ago clash completely with the view of the world that China has. Um, and, you know, something very interesting, and, and I watch this, is that, you know, I, I've observed this uh, in the last few decades is, you know, it, usually, it, it used to be that thinking that, you know, cultures can be better or worse in certain ways was not a controversial thing, right? Like, you, you look at history, and realistically, when, when you study history, all that it is is a lot of people trying to recognize things from previous cultures that they wanted to take with them and things from previous cultures that they wanted to reject, right? When people are studying the Greeks and the Romans and the Renaissance, that, that's, that's all it is. Um, and for some reason now we're not allowed to say that the values that the Chinese Communist Party stands for are horrific. We don't want that for ourselves and we will stand up for what we believe in and that we actually think that our culture is good. Why aren't we allowed to say that? Well, because we've had a lot of, you know, in the last, uh, ever, ever since the early 2000s and, and since before then, uh, we've had a lot of the elites, a lot of the leadership in this country to say, oh, you, you know, you can't say that China is bad. In some ways, that's racist. Uh, you can't say that, you know, America is good because, you know, that's white privilege. Um, it, <laughs> and we started regulating um, what people are allowed to say, what people are allowed to think. Uh, and then with the rise of social media, um, those problems all became, became significantly magnified. So this is a really interesting point that I think is becoming more obvious. Uh, in the last two and a half years, somehow uh, we condemned uh, either implicitly or explicitly uh, individuals who questioned mainstream narratives. And you can go through public health crisis, the solution, uh, inflation, you know, just down the line. Uh, but those people are having the last laugh. 
And uh, the one that just, I think, is hitting people over the head is uh, within the last couple of days, the CDC came out and issued new guidance around the virus uh, and the vaccine. And they're now saying that if you test positive, you don't have to quarantine. And they're saying that uh, people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated should be treated the same. They're also saying things like if a child contracts uh, COVID-19, they don't have to skip a day of school. And so if you had said that two weeks ago, you would have been condemned publicly, privately, uh, and quite literally, you could potentially lose your job and many other uh, pieces of of blowback. uh, Well, I mean, here is one, right? So crazy. This morning, I think I I saw this this morning on the way over here. Denmark just banned COVID-19 vaccines on children. (laughs) <laughs> are, are they all Trumpists now? Like, are, are they all Trump supporters now? Or are we still not allowed to have that conversation? What, why is it that we can't have the conversation? Like in, in the United States, there's 100% uh, a line that gets drawn uh, that appears to be moving, but there's a line. This is allowed to be talked about. This is not allowed to be talked about. Well, um, there's a person who has documented this better than anybody, um, Martin Gurry, right? That wrote the, the revolt of the public. Um and in, in a lot of ways, the elites that we have today know that their days are counted. Um, you know, with the rise of social media and the fact that everybody now has a microphone that they can speak to, um, these people have completely lost their minds in a lot of ways uh, trying to save themselves from the fact that you know, elites are not as powerful as they used to be, mm-hmm. right? It used to be 20 years ago that, you know, the New York Times was the paper of record and you just watched CNN and you had a, a view of the world because the elites told you what, that, what, what, what was true or not. Now you can't do that anymore, right? Like you have independent journalists, you have uh, Twitter um, disproving things that the government said was true, you know, like a few hours ago. So... Because of that, you know, we're definitely living, you know, ever since 2016, a very deep reactionary moment that these elites are not okay with seeing their power fading away. Um, and with, you know, the institutional decay that's happening, right? So, like, people don't care about what the CDC thinks anymore, right? So the CDC is, 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 has been in this weird position of, okay, um, do we lie to save or to save face? Do do we lie because that would make us more credible, or you know, do we go back on our word of like two weeks ago? Um, and some of this is malicious for sure, but some of this is also the fact that you know, it turns out that you know, in those positions you're dealing with incomplete information all the time. Mm-hmm. You don't know what's true, and things are going to change. Um, and, and we don't have a generation of leaders that really know how to live in this new digital world, in this new world of Twitter and social media. Um, And they're still stuck to their old ways. Would these people be better off if they just came out? Let's take uh, the Federal Reserve as one example, maybe the CDC as another. Uh, During the public health crisis, if the CDC just came out and said, hey, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of moving parts, we don't know yet. Here's the things that we're doing to try to get a better handle on what's happening. Here's the things that we're trying to do to get a better handle on what you should be doing. Uh, we'll come back to you with more information when we have it. And in the Federal Reserve's case, coming out and saying, hey, we had to step in. We mitigated short-term pain. It's likely that we're going to get some high inflation. Make sure that you're prepared. By the way, we're going to do everything we can to keep it under control. We'll keep you updated as we go. Like, is that the better strategy in today's digital age uh, of communication from the institutions to the people? Or is it better to do what both of those organizations did? And again, are they being ignorant or are they being malicious? Up for debate. Uh, but they definitely said something that was provably wrong. Uh, and it doesn't feel, uh, whether right or wrong, it doesn't feel like they were actually being transparent about what their current thoughts were. Yeah, I mean, I, I do want to be clear that I do believe that, you know, what, is he, what the CDC has done and the, and the degree to which we've been lied to is inexcusable. Um, so whatever they tried to do was, you know, borderline criminal in a lot of ways. Um, however, like in the future, um, I do think that there is a role for, you know, doing what you're saying, admitting, simply because the alternative is not possible anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the idea that you're going to say something 
and the world's going to change and the world's not going to hear about it because of social media, because of all of these things, it's not realistic. Like people have access to information. People are going to look at Twitter. People are going to read Substack. Um, so you can't control everything unless you want to be China, right? So if we're not going to do that, then you absolutely need a, a new generation of leaders that acknowledges the world that we live in today. I, I think if during the early days of the virus, if somebody had stood up and said, I don't know, two questions, I said, I don't know that answer, right? We're working on it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think people would have trusted them way more. Oh, for sure. Right? For sure. But for some reason, uh, it, it's like an egotistical or an arrogant uh, uh, belief of the world that you can't say that because if you say it, for some reason, you think that you lose credibility, you lose uh, kind of the elite status. Uh, but the internet, if there's anything that we've seen, uh, it's the opposite. And actually by presenting kind of the arrogant elitist view of the world, you lose all credibility. And, yeah. you know, is there an institution now where the American people have the utmost trust. I mean, if you go through all of these institutions, the presidential administration, I mean, we had pretty much two different ends of the spectrum over the last, you know, call it six years, eight years, whatever it is. 50% uh, of the country doesn't agree, right? If not more. I think right now the president's uh, approval rating is down below 40% or at 40%. Not good. Uh, if you look at all of the economic situations. I mean, there's a meme of the Federal Reserve chairman just print, you know, using a money printer. Like for in some ways like that epitomizes just the public's view right. of this. You can look at all of the public health stuff and then you can even look at some of the law enforcement agencies. Like one of the craziest things to me is when you look at from a, a extremist standpoint, you had one side of the aisle screaming defund the police and now you have another side of the aisle screaming like defund the FBI. Yep. Right. And so it's, there's almost no institution that is safe from the internet and the internet is kind of coming for all of them one by one. Yeah, no, it, it, it absolutely is. Uh, you know, I think that's a lot of what Martin Gurry talks about. Um, and I do think that the, the scary fact is that we don't know, we, we don't necessarily know how to rebuild them. That answer is definitely not clear yet. Um, the internet is, in, in a lot of ways, this thing that breaks every institution, mm -hmm. but is not very good at rebuilding it. Mm -hmm. um, and that that will be that that will definitely be the the major challenge um, of the next ten twenty years. I mean, aside from the geopolitical stuff, I think from an internal perspective, um, it is possible. And I'm not saying I, I believe this, but it is possible that we're going to be sitting, you know, thirty years from now and say like, hey. Was the social media thing like actually good overall? Like, did did it make it better or worse? And we may not like uh, what we see. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, an employee recently at Twitter uh, who's no longer at the company uh, who was found guilty of spying uh, for Saudi Arabia. And the details aren't necessarily super super important as much as the idea that a country has an individual working at social media company is another kind of, um, you know, aspect of this battle that we've been talking about, where if China has mobile apps on our phones and they can control what the algorithm says, that's, I think most people would agree, probably not the greatest thing. But then also like, what about the employees that work at some of these organizations? Like, how do you think through, <laughs> uh, that, that situation? Well, um, I mean, I'm glad that it finally came out that that, that Twitter has uh, you know some people from working there uh, to favor Saudi Arabia, but you know foreign intelligence, uh, we, we, you know trying to spy on startups is by far like an like it's, it's it's an extremely prevalent thing in Silicon Valley, and I, I use Silicon Valley broadly. I mean think think about it this way, right? Like if you are a foreign intelligence, you know, a foreign intelligence agency working for a government like Saudi Arabia or China, um, why would you not try to spend some money to get information or get, you know, agents working in tech or in Silicon Valley? Tech, tech is a shiny thing on the hill that a lot of people aspire to. As you know, uh, it's extremely unstructured. Um, it's very decentralized in some ways. Um, 
so much of it is based on trust. So much of it is interpersonal. So, you know, getting people inside of those companies is not that hard. But are these large tech companies like the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, uh, or is the concern more about them getting into companies like uh, Palantir, Anduril, SpaceX that have uh, a national defense bent? Right? Oh, like, it's all of the above. You think it's all of them? Oh, yeah, it's all of them. And, and once these individuals are inside of these organizations, and I, I don't think you or I have an opinion as to, you know, is it one individual at all of Google or is it, you know, 5% of the workforce? So let's shy, hopefully, we'll cross our fingers and hope it's on the smaller end. Um, is it just passing of information? Is it actively working against the company? Like, like what is the risk uh, that people uh, are worried about in terms of if these individuals get hired at the business? Oh. How combative is it versus more as an information gathering exercise? Oh, um, and, and this is where I may get accused of being crazy conspiratorial, but I, I 100% believe that there are people inside of Twitter that are trying to suppress content that is you know, not in the interest of the CCP. This episode is brought to you by 8sleep. Good sleep is a game changer and the 8sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8sleep pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an eight sleep. You can go to eightsleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. Eightsleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. Eightsleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an eight sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. I, I believe that fully and I, I, I've sort of seen it happen. Uh, you know, I have a lot of friends, I, I have a lot of people who are, you know, deep in national security that have told me that, you know, you, you just look at the numbers, right? Like, okay, like, you know this, like you have like a million, over a million followers on Twitter. You kind of know what to expect when you, when you say a post, like, okay. There are like, certain words and China is one of them. Yeah. That on pretty much every platform we have, if you say it and you put in the title or you do whatever, uh, somehow it's just not that popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, really weird, right? Like you, like you can say, "Hello, good morning," and you're gonna get a thousand likes, and or you can post some things that are, you know, adversal to Venezuela or Brazil, and you're still gonna get some likes. But you say the word China, and there's nothing. And you think that that is likely? Again, we don't know for sure, but likely uh, intentional. I, 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 I don't. I struggle to see what are the other options. How do we solve the problem or how do we evaluate that threat? Is it just hope that our national defense uh, capabilities and national intelligence uh, organizations are able to, to figure that stuff out as it appears uh, someone along the way was able to figure out this, uh, this employee that was uh, helping Saudi Arabia at Twitter or is it something else? Well, I mean, part of it is that we need to cross our fingers and knock the table that Elon end up, ends up buying Twitter <laughs> against, against his will uh, at this point. Uh, so, you know, I, I do think that having an individual like that is necessary to, you know, to solving this. But, you know, Pomp, to, to be completely honest, like, I think what we need to do is to fight back, you know? Like, I think, it, it, and this is part of the culture that doesn't let us say things uh, that, that we've seen happen uh, more recently. But, you know, I still come back to this, and, and, and I think... The, the example of like the Soviet Union or GM in, in, in the forties, these people would not like if those people were here today and they saw what's happening with you know companies lobbying to you know build chip manufacturing in China, that kind of stuff. That, that is so anti. Is, it, it goes so against the interests of of the United States. Mm. You know these prior generations would not hesitate to call those people traitors. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Why are we so afraid to speak up? Like mm -hmm. when, when we look at, you know, the example of Twitter that, you know, there are people inside of Twitter that may be favoring interests that run against the interests of the United States. Like, why are we afraid to call that out for what it is and say that people in Twitter are, you know, doing something that could be treasonous to the U.S.? Right. And, and who has the courage to investigate that? Mm -hmm. Right. We need more of it, which, mm -hmm. by the way, like, is par partially why I'm bullish in Florida. It's partially why uh, I, I see a lot of what's happening here and I think is encouraging. 
Florida is the one state in the nation that we've seen the interest in fighting back. 100%. It feels also like uh, the rest of the country or, or many places in the country look at it and they say, uh, that's insane. That's extreme. That is whatever. Uh, but I think people who live here are saying, no, that is exactly what you would expect from somebody who uh, has a very specific vision of the future. And if you disagree with that vision of the future, obviously you're not going to like what they do, but they're saying it's worth fighting for. Yeah. And, and they're going for it. And I think, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the social media platforms, but there's companies like Disney, which those are the ones that absolutely blow my mind, right? right. Where uh, Disney now has more subscribers than Netflix, right, from a size standpoint. Obviously, Disney has incredible intellectual property. It has the physical um, amusement parks, all these different things. Uh, but it is insane, I mean, yeah. if you look at some of the things, and look, we can talk about the geopolitical conflict and, and adversaries and, and all that one component, but also just some of the information. You know, I, I have an eight month old daughter and uh, there's been multiple times where we've turned on some cartoon and I look at my wife and I'm like, shut this off. This is insane. You know, Pop, we went from a world where, you know, the mainstream American left went from, you know, fighting wars in the Middle East is bad. Let's stand for peace and let's stand for equality to a world in which we're now having a very serious argument about whether or not te teaching gen gender ideology to five-year-olds is a good thing, right? Like that is the world that we're living in now. Uh, and people just went crazy and COVID magnified all of that. But, of but realistically, this has been the case for, you know, 10, 20 years at this point. I do think, um, and people hate when I say this, but uh, I, I fundamentally believe it. We need to bring back the right to offend people. Yes, we, we have we have somehow uh, condemned if you offend anyone, regardless of if you're right or not, you're wrong. And what I think ends up happening is like there is a right and wrong in many facets. Right. If you ask somebody stealing, if you literally go to some cities in America and you say uh, this person stole something, there are some people who will say, well, why did they steal it? Did they did they absolutely have to do it? Then that's OK. Right. And, and you say to yourself, whoa, hold on a second here, right? Like something that should be like hard line in the sand. There's right, there's wrong. These are the rules for us to have a functioning society where people feel safe and feel like uh, uh, the future is better than it, the past. You can't steal. But as we've seen, San Francisco being one of those well, places, and, and it doesn't feel that way. And, and, and you know, and, and David Sachs has, has done a great job of this, but realistically, like, this is why basically you see every single different ethnicity now leaving the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. right? Like, the, like, we talked a little bit about Latin America. We see this happening a lot now, that, that you see that, you know, Hispanics now uh, disapprove President Biden more than white, more than white people do. Mm -hmm. It's by far the number one category. So we're definitely going to see... Uh, a whole new wave uh, of different ethnicities that reject American progressivism. Mm -hmm. uh, realistically, when you took at every, when you look at everything that has been done in, in the last fifty years with Alinsky and all of those things, in the way that you know we've communicated things to people, the way that we you know got new generations to believe that America was bad and that you know you're a bad person because you're white and and all those kind of things, it turns out that like. If you're Hispanic, you don't give a shit about that, <laughs> right? Like you, you, you still like you, your culture is mostly conservative. You're not going to approve your children being taught sex at school with like five year olds. Um, and you're going to reject crime, right? So like we're going to see that, you know, a return to sanity in some ways, because what we have right now is not sustainable. Well, it's the, the bullshit and sanity of society definitely comes from a position of privilege, right? Like if you look around the world, the countries where uh, they have the most stress, uh, the most uh, conflict, uh, they have uh, many of the issues uh, where people are worried about safety, food, all that type of stuff. None of this should exist. Yeah, I mean, so right? many, so many of these problems today are just luxury problems. Yes, right, one hundred percent. If you have the ability uh, to spend that much time thinking about and doing some of these things, uh, it's just yeah, you, 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 life's pretty good for you. Right. right. And I think part, again, um, I also think a lot about uh, 
when you're evaluating founders and startup teams, uh, one of the big questions is, you know, do they know some secret? Are, are they able to, to uh, um, kind of figure out how to attract talent and all stuff? But also just like, will these people not quit? Right? Can, can they just weather the storm? This shit is going to be hard. They're working on a hard problem. It's going to be a long period of time. Will they just not quit? And when you extrapolate that out to society, I do wonder in certain areas uh, geographically, what percentage of people have lived through, quote unquote, tough times? And that can incorporate all kinds of different things, right? There are people who immigrated to the country. There's people who have experienced economic hardship. There are people who maybe it's just they got bullied at school, right? I mean, there's all kinds of ways to evaluate kind of tough times. But I do think that because the United States and the economic prosperity that we've had and uh, uh, kind of the, I don't know, infiltration of some of these socialist ideas uh, and also just the softening of the country, there's a higher and higher percentage of people never done anything hard. Yeah. I mean, so what, one of my favorite quotes of all times is uh, Jeff Kennedy uh, would choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it is hard. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and realistically, people today have become soft. Now, people have become soft, and this, this is where it, 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 it's, it's a real paradox in some ways. People have become soft because we actually have some of the greatest times in history, <laughs> right? Like we have, we have had, for the last seven years, we have had an amazing economy. Uh, we have had unprecedented growth rate, poverty at an all-time low. Um, so in some ways, the world is amazing. But because we have gotten rid of all of those ideas, all of those values, um, we, we're not allowed really, uh, well, we, we don't have a generation that, that really strives for anything, mm-hmm. right? Uh, by, by the way, we haven't really gotten, gotten into this, but, you know, with the decay of institutions, with the decay of religion and all of these things, right? Um, all of the conversations that we have about society today ends up, ends up becoming a, 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 a conversation about whether something should be legal or not, right? Like, we, we have a conversation, pick every issue that it is, and you know, it can be guns right, gun rights or whatever it is. Um, and it becomes a hard line of like, hey, should this, should this be legal or not legal? In reality, we don't have conversations anymore about virtues and values, mm-hmm. right? Like there is no conversation about this is who we are. This is the culture that we live in. This is what, this is, what is acceptable or not acceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, in a, in a weird way, that is what liberalism has devolved into. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we need to bring back the idea of morals. We need to bring back the idea of virtues. I, I would take this even a step further. I think that there's uh, a, a conversation around ethics and morals. And I was uh, recently talking uh, to someone about this idea that um, it's being weaponized uh, in a way that I don't think most of us uh, originally agreed to or, or originally sought it. So, for example, uh, in science— There are certain things that people say, hey, there may be some benefit for uh, us to explore, experiment, or even potentially get breakthroughs in X. And then there will be people who show up and say, well, I am a uh, biology uh, ethicist, right? You say, what the hell is that? (laughs) And then they say, that is unethical. And so it, it, it's almost in some way, not only do we not have the direction and, and kind of moral compass of what we do stand for, it's been flipped on its head and now it is uh, used as a weapon to argue against uh, certain things because it is unethical. And when you ask them and, and, and what I've said previously is like morals are important, but when you start getting into this ethics conversation and it's just everything is unethical, you have to start to ask yourself, well, like what is the framework in which we determine what our morals are? Right. And if, again, go back to stealing, lying, cheating, these things that I think, Most of humanity, uh, any culture and any society, they agree like these are not good things, right? We do not want to stand for those things. But then when you move to a a sector like science, and and I think actually in uh, Silicon Valley, we we saw this. There was a lot of people who argued it was unethical to invest in defense startups because it led to A, B, or C thing. And and, uh, investors would opt out and say our LPs do not want us investing in this. It's unethical. And then you turn around and you're like, that's stupid <laughs> because, again, it goes back to you're using an attack that isn't actually rooted in an understanding of, like, what is the moral compass? What is the things that we actually need? And uh, an- another example of this is uh, around energy and the whole ESG movement. And, you know, if you look at a, com- a country like Germany, 
Like they fell, you know, hook, line and sinker for the, oh, it's unethical. Oh, it's, you know, it's not good. And now they're basically begging for oil. Yep. And it's just, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if it can be reversed because I think that it's become so deep seated, but, but we should try. Well, you know, this is where, and to be clear, I haven't given much thought to this, but, you know, it's funny to me that a lot of people keep saying, oh, we need a new renaissance, we need a new renaissance. Uh, and I was like, you know, maybe we need a new counter-reformation. You know, we, what we need to do is we've had a generation of people trying to convince us that America was bad and that we should reject American ideals and that culture here sucks um, and that, you know, the world is about to end because of climate change. And what we need to do is say, hey, we've made some mistakes. Uh, you know, there are things in the past that we actually need to improve on, but we need to bring back the ideals and values that we had before. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that, that's that's a parallel with the Catholic Church, with the Catholic Church. Um, and I mean, you use the examples of like people in Silicon Valley, like freaking out about investing in Andrew, uh, you know, like people in Germany, all that kind of stuff. And, and the reality is like, what do those people believe in? Like, what do they stand for? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and when you look at it, it's it's not that much. Uh, I, the, the core ideal. Right. Like we've heard this word so much more than we had uh, many years ago. Uh, equity, right? Like the, the idea of equity. Um, and in some ways, like if you look at American history, right? Like the American history inspired by classic liberalism, uh, by, you know, enlightenment ideals, mostly influenced by British culture, right? And there's actually a side of the enlightenment that was pretty bad, right? Like if you look at, uh, you know, the French Revolution and, and like people talking about bloods of, uh, rivers of blood coming down, coming down the streets. Um, and, you know, France talked a lot about liberty, but France also talked about equality and fraternity. And, and if you go back to, the, to these philosophers, they have a very different idea of liberty than, you know, the British ones did and the American, Americans ones did. And in some ways, like, I, I always think about the word liberalism because liberalism in America means something very different mm -hmm. than, than liberalism in the rest of the world means. In the rest of the it, world... Explain the difference. Yeah, in the rest of the world, liberalism still means classical liberalism. So when you use the word in, in, in Brazil or when you use the word in, in, in Europe, people think that you're just talking about free markets, uh, you know, individual rights, that kind of stuff. And liberalism in, in America today is a word that the left has taken over. Um, and realistically, the world that we're living in is a world of liberalism, but is a world of li liberalism that, inv that essentially prizes the values of equality and equity and fraternity much more than the actual individual rights and individual freedom that, that, that America was founded upon, right? Um, and that's how you end up. That's how you end up with, you know, yeah, certain things about biology being bad because people don't like the results and therefore it's unethical, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it's how you end up with, you know, not investing the company in the companies that are going to stand up for your country because, you know, you think your country is a bad thing. <laughs> um, so Those people never seem to move out of the country, by the way. Yeah, no, no, never, right? Like, like we, we, could, we could make a program to flight them to, to Caracas, one-way ticket for free, and they would never take it, right? <laughs> it, it's surprising, right? Well, it's, you know, they have family. They come up with a bunch of reasons as to why maybe that's not a great idea. I, I do think it's interesting. Uh, have you looked at all as to uh, uh, Governor Abbott in uh, Texas is taking migrants, putting them on buses, oh, yeah. and bussing them to New York and Washington, D.C.? Oh, by, by the way, so I, I, I love to talk about this because it's, it's, um, it's really interesting to me as an immigrant, right? Like, talk about ways that we've perverted American culture. Um, and this is, you know, when you asked me about the immigrant question, I was like, you know, like there's something about me being an immigrant that, that sure revitalizes the idea of the American dream. But I actually think American people need to stand up for their own. Um, you know, ultimately, the, the debate around immigration in the America is just so weird it, and it's just so weaponized intentionally. So, you know, you go to any other country on Earth and they're not having a debate about illegal immigration. Right. It, that, that is just a, such an insane idea that we actually have a dominant political party in the United States that actually tries to defend like Ill illegal immigration. Right. And well, like the first word there is pretty important. Yeah, exactly. Like, right. Like, <laughs> right. So, so like to me is like, by, by the way, Blake Masters got in a lot of heat for saying this. It's like, what is the right number of illegal? Like, let's have a debate, a debate about illegal, illegal immigration. What is the right number of illegal immigrants that should be 
allowed to in America. It's like zero. Like, <laughs> like why, why is that controversial? Right. Like yeah. I had to come here. I had to follow a process. My family came here. They had to follow a process. Right. Like it's so funny because I talked about this with my immigrant friends and the idea of illegal immigration is almost insulting. Right. Like, do you know all the pain and process and money that we have to spend to come here? Uh, and I understand that, like, not all the people may have the, the access to these things to come. And, you know, maybe there are there should be government programs to to allow people to come here, even, you know, if they if they don't have the, the ability to, to pay for some things, we could have that conversation. But I think the starting point is illegal immigration it's not good simply because we have institutions, we have laws, you know, and if the act that people come here, the first, their first act is, you know, moving, breaking those laws, then, you know, that is actually not good for our institutions. That is not good for the system that we believe in. Right. So like what Greg, Greg Abbott did is actually like hilarious, right? Like, like it's so funny because we have all of these people saying, actually, we should allow, you know, illegal immigrants here. And he's saying, no, we shouldn't. And then he said, okay, like you want some, I'll, I'll send them over to you. And then they see all the issues that come up with it. And they're like, oh my God, like oh, what did you do? They want, they want to send them back. They're, they're literally saying, we're going to send them back. We don't want them. Right, right. And, and like, listen, like I'm saying this as an immigrant, like, I think it is important for, for, for a country to have an immigration system that serves the interests of the country. And we can have a debate about what that is, right? Like, it is fair to have the debate. But the idea that, like, you can just take in anybody is a pretty insane idea, right? You're, you're, you're proving a, a theory that I have after um, talking. Almost all of my close friends are immigrants. Um, not intentionally, just for whatever reason. Uh, uh, that's the, the situation I've ended up in life. Uh, I'm very happy with it. Um, but the people who came here legally, they're more pissed about the illegal immigration than Americans are. Well, it's because like you're making us your political tool, mm -hmm. right? Like we should not be having this debate. You know why? Like the immigration system is not something hard to fix. The reason why people are having that debate is because they can get elected on those things. Mm -hmm. Let me take you some a different example. Vol voter ID, right? That is an insane thing to me coming from, you know, a, a different place thinking that America actually has an issue with that. Because the reality is it doesn't, right? Like it's very easy to fix in any country in the world that you go to, the idea that you have to show your ID so you can vote is not a controversial thing. <laughs> um, but the fact that you can actually fight against that here you know, use some really spicy words to call people, to, to call your opponents off if, if they don't agree with you and then get elected on that so that they, then you do nothing and get elected on that again for years is effectively, is effectively what has happened with vo voter ID, immigration and all of those issues. It, it's like part of it is the fact that we can have the conversation is the beauty of America, but also the fact that we need to have the conversation is the stupidity of America. Yeah, you know, Churchill has this quote, uh, which is a pretty funny one, that is, uh, you know, America will always do the right thing, provided they try everything else first. Um, <laughs> and ultimately, there is something about the beauty, the beauty of that system. And, and by the way, I think to some degree is why America has worked. Um, you know, the idea of democracy is actually really fucking hard. You know, the idea of, a, you know, absolute democracy is actually not that good, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why America is not a democracy, right? America is a constitutional republic. So, you know, you need a degree of federalism, you need a degree of freedom, and you need a degree of balance of power that America has figured out. But that comes with a lot of constraints, but that comes with a lot of balances and weights so that, you know, people don't go crazy and try to, you know, write a new constitution every 20 years, which happens in basically every other country in the world, mm -hmm. right? So... It takes time, it's complicated, but hopefully we get to the right answer as we have in the last, you know, 20 plus years. Yeah. Do you think that given where we are right now, America's future is brighter or darker than the past? And not so much can we do different things to change that answer, but just if you take a snapshot of where we are right now, brighter or darker? It's darker. Uh, uh, like, like we, it, it, like the trend line is not positive. Mm -hmm. Um, now I'm not saying this to, to sound defeatist, to sound nihilistic. Uh, that's not what I want. That's not, you know, when I wake up every day, like I'm trying to like, I, to hopefully do something to change that. But I think we should recognize that we're in a pretty dire situation. Uh, perhaps one that is unprecedented in history. Um, and 
if we don't work hard to change it, then 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 we're screwed. Yeah. What, what are the one or two things you think are the most important to change that path? Well, I do think strategically, like from a geopolitical standpoint, we absolutely need to find ways to stand up to China. Uh, you know, for example, like Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan, I'm not entirely sure that's that's how we should do it. Uh, after she said she was going to do it, I'm glad she went. Uh, but, you know, we need to, you know, to, to use the Chinese words, like we need to hide our capabilities and bide, bide our time to some degree so that we sort out this, this supply chain situation, the semiconductor situation, and we need five to 10 years to rebuild those things here and in our, in our allies' countries. Um, so we absolutely need to fix that. Mm -hmm. And then, quite frankly, like we need to fix our culture, right? Mm -hmm. Like we absolutely need to fix the culture. The, the degree to which our culture has been destroyed uh, in the last 10, 20 years is absurd. It, like it's, it's only starting now to be clear to people, you know, because, you know, the idea of being, be, uh, you know, bringing kids to, you know, a drag, drag queen, uh, you know, uh, thing like was not normal and like that that somehow like still like gets gets the average American <laughs> uh, really upset um, so, so but we need to fight back and, and, and we're still in the early days of that I, I always think just go back to like the Great Depression imagine that being a thing that a school tried to do yeah. people, people, there'd be uh, unfortunately there'd be violence yeah right I mean they'd just be like get my kid out of there yeah. Uh, and, and, um, you know, I don't think violence is the answer, but I, I do think that, uh, there's going to be a, a kind of resurgence back. My last question for you, uh, it seems like, um, the American political system, uh, has had a lot of volatility, you know, one extreme, another extreme back and forth, back and forth. Can a centrist actually become president and, uh, get a united front in America, uh, without having to evoke war or, or some sort of external threat to be able to do that? Or do you think we'll just kind of play this like ping pong game back and forth between the extremes uh, and the parties will, you know, flip flop every couple of years for the foreseeable future? I, I am very skeptical of the idea of centrism as being a political goal for someone. Uh, and I'm not sure that it is possible in the environment, in the polarized environment that we need in today, that, that we're in today, to have someone like that really succeed. I mean, talk about Joe Biden, right? Like, President Biden came in supposedly to be that person, right? Like, he campaigned on the idea of bringing down the tension. Uh, and then now he, he's, you know, either, you know, willingly or, you know, have become captive of this, you know, much of far, you know, progressive left. Uh, so ultimately, I, I, I don't think, uh, for better or worse, that, you know, the idea of having like a centrist uh, is actually possible. Um, and like realistically, right, like to be honest, like I'm not even sure who that person would be, right? Like, mm -hmm. do we really want mainstream Democrats or mainstream Republicans to actually run the country? Like, I think there's actually bipartisan agreement that those people suck <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> right? Like nobody wants them. Um, so I, I don't, I, I think things will remain polarized. Um, what I do think is you need to have a president with actually more executive power than before that is not authoritarian in any way, but to actually reduce the tension everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a president that actually has the power to say, you know, Soros funding every single prosecutor so that then, you know, these prosecutors, progressive prosecutors destroy our cities is not a good thing. This is why, like, what DeSantis did, like, we haven't really talked about this, but, like, what DeSantis did, like, last week or two weeks ago was one of the most brilliant moves of any politician in the last, like, five years. What did he do? Well, so he, Soros had backed a lot of prosecutors uh, throughout the country, right? Like, including a few that got elected, like, uh, somewhere in Florida. Um, and those prosecutors basically said, we are not going to enforce the law. Like, it was, you know, in the case of an abortion law, not to get into the whole abortion discussion, but, like, Florida passed a law that is actually much more lenient towards ab abortion than most countries in Europe, right? So, like, we're not talking about, like, Mississippi or Missouri here. Like, we're talking about a law that is much more lenient than Europe. And these prosecutors said, we're not going to enforce the law. And DeSantis basically said, you know, I'm suspending you because you're here to enact the law and you as a prosecutor are not above the law and therefore you're not fulfilling your duty and according to the constitution of Florida, you're suspended. Um, and so basically, 
he said, here's your job. They said, I'm not going to do your job. And then he said, you're suspended, fired, 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 whatever. And uh, the prosecutors have a problem with that? Yeah, pretty much so. Um, That's interesting. So I do believe that, you know, for these issues to be fixed, for a lot of the issues we talked um, about today to be fixed, we need to have a president that has the will to do some things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's this weird dichotomy that in one, in a few ways, you're actually, you know, saying that you want a president that has more power, but overall that will probably calm down tensions in America and it will bring the overall, you know, uh, like size of the U.S. administrative state, you know, it will shrink the U.S. administrative state. Yeah. I am uh, generally a, a pretty big optimist, as I think you are as well. Um, and uh, one of the most uh, pessimistic conversations I've had recently, uh, I, I was uh, uh, walking and uh, uh, there's a couple police officers and um, started talking and, and uh, I said, so- I forget exactly what I said, but they basically made a comment like, oh, it's going to get worse. And I said, what? And they said, you know, one guy said, I've been a cop uh, in Miami for 10 years. And he's like, I'm going on my 11th year. He goes, and I've progressively seen it get worse and worse and worse. And I said, you know, again, there's a whole bunch of complexity here, but like, what, why, why do you think that? And he basically made the point that uh, there's some ridiculous rules. I said, like, what's an example? And they essentially were trying to highlight to me that there's rules like if they see somebody commit a crime, but it's not a violent crime, they can't chase them. And like, again, there's complexity in that, but I think the average person says if a police officer who, again, there's plenty to complain about, there's plenty to say, hey, they're, they're doing a good job, right? Uh, but if they see a crime occur, <laughs> they just like, what are you going to like wave to the guy? Well, not only that, right? So you, crazy. You have, and by the way, like not to sound too conspiratorial here, but I, I don't think the following things are disconnected, right? So on the one hand, you have... Uh, you know, all of these laws getting passed saying don't enforce crimes, crime, you know, we, San Francisco, for example, effectively legalized crime. And then on the other hand, you have the complete bashing of that institution, uh, uh, right? Like the police, right? Like you, you basically had Minnesota, thank God it got rejected, but the idea of like completely, you abolish know, the, the the, yeah, the, the abolishing the police, right? So like, and, and then all cops are racist now. So like who will ever want to work for? For an institution like that, right? Well, like, the, the the people who end up going to work there once you've destroyed it are probably the people that you didn't want to be the police officers anyway. Exactly, exactly. So I don't believe, and maybe that sounds too, too conspiratorial, but I don't believe those things are disconnected, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and w- when you put the two and two together, like, that does not look good. Yeah, and, and I also think it's similar to the immigrant uh, thing where, like, the immigrants who came to the United States legally are the ones who are the most upset about the illegal immigration. Uh, if you go to some of these police forces, it's the police who do the things the right way that are the most pissed off about the police officers who do things the wrong way. Right. And it highlights, like, look, there are absolutely 100%, if you go talk to a police force, uh, police officers who do things the right way and police officers who do things the wrong way. And unfortunately, as in many things, the people who do it the wrong way give the entire set a bad name. Uh, but the ones who do it the right way are just as pissed off as the public. Yeah. The thing, though, is we don't see that. Yes. Right? Because it's, they don't have a platform. They can't go on Twitter and say, hey, I'm a police officer at this you know, police department in you know, a random city in America, and like the guy down uh, the locker room is doing you know, A, B, and C thing wrong, and like it's pissing me off. Yeah, we haven't really talked about this today, but you know, a lot of the underlying issues with so many of these things, I mean, you gave the example of biology, a lot of what's happening with woke, woke culture in companies today is the fact that effectively the system has, for, for the last 20 years, uh, worked as a minority rule. Mm-hmm. So you have you know, the 5% craziest people, you know, the wokest people, effectively say the most absurd things and get that framed as the opinion of the company, as the opinion of the police force, as the opinion of the whole institution. Right. I mean, we saw that, like, for example, like Apple and Antonio Garcia Martinez. Right. Like you have like a few individuals in this company of like 100,000 people who say, oh, this person shouldn't be here. Like he is terrible, whatever. And the company acts because of the opinion, like this vast, tiny number of people. I do think this is, you know, talk about optimism. I do think that this has become so evident, so clear that we might see a sea of change mm-hmm. um, because that doesn't work as well anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, 
I've enjoyed this quite a bit. Uh, we didn't talk at all about Village Global or anything <laughs> else that you're doing. Uh, maybe just share with everyone uh, kind of the types of founders you guys are looking for and, and what you spend your day doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that uh, if anyone is listening and, and uh, wants to, to spend more time talking to you. Yeah, yeah, them. no, for sure. Um, always accessible. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, you know, I want to be clear. My opinions here today and not necessarily the whole opinion of Village Global, uh, but uh, super excited to have that conversation. Uh, and, you know, Village, we're an early stage firm, pre-seed and seed, investing anywhere from 250K to a million. Uh, anywhere around the globe, not China, uh, and you know, uh, really looking for amazing founders, right? Like we we come in so early; it's so common for us to invest at day zero uh, to back founders when they have nothing, just an idea. Um, that is even you know, like some people ask about like what metrics do you look for? It's like none because there, there were almost never any. Um, so you know, strong founders with a secret that have an ambitious view of the future. Uh, that's that's what we're looking for. Yeah, uh, I appreciate your time today. Uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, of you, Village Global, and the rest of the work you guys are doing. So uh, thanks so much, and we'll definitely do this again in the future. Appreciate it, Paul. Thank you.